So when I turned up this evening, I was a little bit worried that uh, going straight into vector search might be a little bit of a steep uh, entry for ClickHouse. So Christoph kindly uh, did an introduction for us. So thanks again, Christoph, for doing that. And I was also a little bit worried that uh, nobody would, this wouldn't apply to many people's use cases. But the first person that I greeted at the door said, I'm here to learn about vector search in ClickHouse. So <laughs> that was quite a relief. So I want to talk about vector search in ClickHouse and um, whether you really need uh, what's called a vector database, which are quite uh, a fad at the moment, or the, well, a fad, they're quite popular at the moment, and they're getting a lot of attention. And uh, I thought I'd show some of the capabilities of ClickHouse to deal with vectors. So before I start, who is kind of just a rare hands, who knows what the vectors are and their relation to machine learning and what a vector database is? Okay, so pretty pretty strong uh, reply. So I will cover kind of the basics, but for those of you that don't, but I'll go reasonably quickly. And if you have any questions, you can just come and ask me at the end. So um, the first thing I'm gonna focus on is the kind of very brief history of search and focus on search. And there's a great article here that I found, which I think gives a, a fantastic overview of the history of search, right from uh, early information retrieval, right through to kind of chat GPT today and all the developments that were made in the last 10 years. So or the last 40 years even. Uh, so I'd, I, I'll share these slides at the end and you can follow that link, which is great. So history of search was typically words. Um, if you've done Google search, Google's obviously a lot more advanced than this these days. But if you're familiar with maybe something like Elasticsearch, text retrieval really was the basis of search for a very long time. And this goes right back to the 1970s. Uh, you would take a document, you tokenize it, you put it into a bag of words or vocabulary, and you'd create a term index where you've got the words and then references to the documents. And when you searched, you'd look up the word in this index, like the back of a book, and you'd return the documents. And you could do clever things, Boolean search, conjunctions, disjunctions. And this really was the basis for search for a very long time. Obviously, it doesn't give you relevance. And on top of that, various scoring mechanisms were added. And this is really the basis of things, technologies like Elasticsearch and Solar and underneath Lucene. So uh, the classic was TFIDF. Uh, it tries to give you some indication of how relevant the documents are to your search. This developed into an algorithm called BM25, which is sort of probabilistic, but if you actually look at the equations, it looks quite similar to TFIDF and it has a lot of the similar principles. And this is kind of what we would call kind of lexicographical search. So um, it's it's very effective most of the time. Uh, it's limited in a couple of ways. The first is it doesn't. It's very hard to implement search for other mediums. So if you wanted to do stuff like search for images or audio, it's a hard model to move other kind of modals into and and make it apply. Uh, the other thing is that it kind of suffers from the vocabulary problem, which is if the vocabulary of the search terms don't match the vocabulary in the actual corpus or what you've got, it's kind of difficult to get to relevancy and you end up doing a lot of like synonyms and various other solutions to solve that problem. But for a long time, this was a gold standard. And honestly, for tech search, it's probably still solves most use cases. Um, so the advent of, this brings us on to, well, why do we need vectors and embeddings? So this kind of brings in for text specifically, this allows us to do conceptual search. So with the advent of machine learning at scale, we would we've started to train models that take as input, you would train the model on typically a training set, uh, and then you could provide text and uh, other forms of media, so maybe images, maybe audio, and you'd get a vector representation out of that, of that document. Now, it could be obviously an artifact, like a, an image, for example, and those vectors should be comparable. Um, so a vector, just very quickly, is obviously just a series of floating point numbers, uh, where this is a 10-dimensional vector based on the number of entries. And you would normally create, when you attach meaning to the vector, you effectively get an, an embedding. So an embedding for maybe the word moonlight here is a very low representation. It's only six floating point numbers, but each entry in that, in that vector represents some concept. And together, it represents the concept of moonlight. Now, I should say that like the the kind of the traditional search index is almost a kind of sparse vector in a lot of ways because you've got the whole vocabulary and if you had every word as an entry in the vector you could also almost think of it as a vector model as well but this is a dense vector model so it's collapsing the media the the meaning down into far less entries in the vector so you might get dimensions of maybe a few hundred in text search 
the samples I'm going to look at in my demo is like 700 dimensions, 768 dimensions for images. Um, but it's, it's what we call a dense re vector representation. And the key uh, concept of how these embeddings are produced, this is the model that I've used for this particular demo. This is known as the CLIP model. This is produced by OpenAI. The model was trained basically on images and captions um, so that they aligned, it trains to, to basically produce a model that aligns projecting image vectors onto text vectors for the associated caption. And what that allows is useful in certain problems, but principally image search, where you can provide an image and you can find similar captions, or you can generate similar captions. Uh, but you can also do the inverse. So you can provide text vectors and find similar images, whereby associating with the, the, images, the images vectors. So you can go in either direction. And this allows zero shot prediction specifically, which is like classification of images to produce uh, short captions. And it's particularly effective because this was the, the ground, the real breakthrough here was that it, on the images that it was trained on, it was shown to be effective on images that it had never seen before. So this is a, a pretty much a, a, almost a gold standard in specifically image search and text search. And if you use the open, a, open AI APIs, they use this particular model for some of their APIs. So this brings us like on a, to a key concept, which is the importance of distance. Um, in a very crude way to describe, kind of very simplistic, but these vectors, if they are close together in space, they should represent the same meaning. So if I have a vector for an image and I have a vector for a piece of text, and they're talking about, oh, they are about the same concept, they should in theory be close in high dimensional space. And you can measure that in a number of ways. Um, you can measure it with Euclidean distance, you can measure it with dot product, which I suppose is the same almost, and you can measure in cosine angle. But if you just think that these vectors are close together, it means that they are effectively the same, the same thing. So um, that brings us to how do we search these vectors. So if we've got millions and millions or even billions of these vectors and, we have a, and we've generated these for supposedly images, for example, and we have a piece of text that we generate a vector for, how do we then match against these? Well, in ClickHouse, we can do a number of techniques. The first is we can do a linear scan. So we can take the search vector as input and we can linearly go through and score all of the vector or all of the vectors in the data set. And then we can sort those scores. In this case, we're using uh, a distance basically. And the closer the lower the number, the closer the vector is. And at the end, we return the document IDs. Now, the, va uh, the power of ClickHouse here is that because we're a highly parallel engine or processing engine and everything is extremely parallelized, we can split that work over as many cores as you have on your machine. And we'll automatically use all of the cores on the machine to parallelize and break up that work. So we can do potentially very, very large data sets of 100 million, even a billion vector comparisons quite quickly on linear, on, in, in just linear search. But that can still take a while. So there are approximate techniques. And you may have seen vector databases like Weaviate and Pinecone. And they provide, they really focus on this problem. And it's really kind of the, the core value behind their offering, which is they do these approximate techniques and they use there's a number of algorithms. Uh, one of them is this is actually uh, an approximate technique known as a NOI. A NOI works by very simplistically just kind of s s breaking the space up into ever, ever smaller slices or what we call hyperplanes. And you can see that this is kind of that concept and it breaks it into like a tree structure. But these approximate techniques, you trade basically performance, you get faster performance but you get less accuracy. So it's not as, as you don't get the exact answer that you get with a linear scan, but you get an answer which is approximate. So we support Annoy in uh, ClickHouse, but it's currently experimental. And we have some PRs that are open for other algorithms. If, you, if you're familiar with this space, we have PRs open for HNSW and I think also integration with a library called FAS. So uh, I've kind of touched on this already, but beyond just text search, multilingual search, you can also do image and video search, and there's a few others. It's very common in fraud detection, where you have maybe you encode behaviors into the vectors instead of just images, and similar vectors mean similar behaviors. And if, if it's not similar to a good behavior, maybe that's fraud, for example. And also with relation to ChatGPT more recently, you'll see a lot of blogs online where people have basically generated vectors for all their docs. They've put them into a, a vector database, and then when somebody comes to a help bot, it says, how do I help with this? And they 
search for vectors in their database and they provide that as additional context to chat GPT for it to be able to generate a contextualized chat answer effectively. So that's very common. I think Superbase themselves, there's a company called Superbase who do hosted Postgres, have a great blog and if you integrate with their site, that's basically what they're doing. So vector search and click house. So the key is that we're not a vector database. We're a database that happens to provide vector matching as a function. So vectors in ClickHouse are just array 32 points, uh, array of float 32s. And for you that use ClickHouse before, uh, we get about two X, one and a half to two X compression. Now that's quite low for ClickHouse actually. If you put logs in ClickHouse, for example, you'll get 13 X compression in some cases, 10 to maybe even 15 compression, which if you've used other technologies, you might find actually you take the logs, you put them in, and it's larger on disk than it is on the original log or very close. ClickHouse, we compress very, very well. So that's quite a low number for that. And there's some improvements that we're working on around other compression algorithms for floating points to improve that. But the key concept is that matching is just another distance function. So we have a number of distance functions that you can use, cosine, Euclidean being the two main ones, in order to actually compare these arrays of floating points. Uh, we also support full SQL and, and aggregation. So we're principally a SQL engine first with vector matching on top. So you can do some interesting stuff whereby you're searching, for example, for close for similar vectors or, and they could be similar artifacts like images, and you need to aggregate on metadata that you can just use all the SQL functions that ClickHouse supports. And I said, we also support nearest neighbor. And then finally, uh, we support user-defined functions where you can define your own functions in other languages and you can integrate those and then expose those as functions in ClickHouse. And I'll give you an example um, where you can actually just then, for example, create your own function that maybe takes an image as an input on a URL and it generates a vector by using the model and then that gets passed straight into the SQL function. So you can do, for example, select embed image and you create a function called image that you expose in the SQL syntax. So this is kind of what a search would look like. Uh, the, the key thing here is I'm searching over a, a, a table here called Leon, which is the data set that I'll talk about in a moment. And uh, I'm just saying, right, I want to do a match on the image embedding field, which contains our vectors. And this has, got this has got 10 million rows. And then I pass my vector into this function effectively. So it's a series of just arrays of floating point. And then I just sort by the score. And that's a linear scan. So you can see there it's processed about 6.25 million rows a second, and, done, and read disk at about 20 gigabytes a second, which is which is pretty fast. Like that's a pretty fast way. It's pretty decent. I think that's on an eight core machine. That's that's a pretty fast linear scan. So when should I think about using ClickHouse for vector search? Well, if you need scalable linear matching with many cores, I think we're a pretty good we're a pretty good option. Um, also, if you've got metadata with your vector, so you've just vectors are a subset of your, not, are not all of your data, and you'd benefit from high compression and fast querying and filtering. And also, if you want to query vectors with full SQL support, that's really kind of where, where we excel. Um, and we're not memory bound. So in theory, you can do a very large data set, and, when, and you can still do millions, if not billions. And uh, finally, one of the things I would say is that where vector databases excel, like the dedicated vector bases excel is they have like a full uh, pipeline around them, a full ecosystem. So in things like WeV8, you get all of the models built in, both the insert time and query time. We're not that. We're very much just kind of the raw functions for matching. And it's a component of ClickHouse. It's not a kind of dedicated function. So vector databases still have their space. But if, you, if you're using ClickHouse and you've got some vectors, I think it's worth giving it a try. So on to a demo. So for this demo, I've used a data set called Leon. I think that's pronounced right. I haven't quite figured out how that's pronounced. If somebody has a better uh, pronunciation, to let me know. That can see this is a, a data set that was actually created with performance testing in mind. It was trained with this clip model, which is the model I was talking about earlier. Um, and it's very, and it was trained on images and captions. So it's design being that uh, you can effectively search for images or you can search for with uh, on images with text, or you can search for text with images. So you can do it in both directions. And they train that on 100, 400 million image caption pairs using a version of this clip model. Um, the details, like the engineering behind this was is quite impressive. Like having to trawl the entire internet and download 400 million images is quite an undertaking. And then train all of these and then generate vectors for all of them is, 
is pretty is pretty significant amount of compute needed, and they did it quite cost efficiently. Um, and I'm using a 2.2 billion English subset, so every row has a vector for the text from the image, which was the caption that they extracted when they downloaded it, and a vector for the image itself. Uh, and then there was some work here where this data unfortunately wasn't provided in a in a format where the metadata and the vectors were separate. But effectively, I've combined this into parquet files of one gig each, and you can access this publicly now. So we've put this on a public endpoint, and you can download and use this data set yourself, but it's now in Parquet, and it's about 5.9 terabytes in total. So let me see if I can take a seat. This is also what I'm good for. <laughs> <laughs> I can explain click cars and hold mics. Late, late notice demos and mic holding. So. So on the left here, which I'll just show first, is I have I'm on a, I'm on a, a box here with this data set. So this data itself um, is this data set here. You can't maybe quite see that. It's 5.9 terabytes, and this is what we've uh, effectively loaded into ClickHouse. Okay, so this is all the Parquet files in here that we used. So if I just show that, it's like it's a lot of Parquet files. So um, and I. Don't have it open, but you can download this data set, the original data set from Hugging Face as well, which is great for this kind of data. Um, and we've merged this all into Parquet files, as I said. So if I go over to ClickHouse now, and I'll bring ClickHouse up here. So I'll log into the ClickHouse console. Uh, and this is uh, one of these tables. So this has got only 1 million entries. Um, and what I've done is I've just created tables of different sizes. So the suffix represents the table size itself. Uh, and you can see there's, there's a lot of metadata on here. So we have right down to, which I thought was quite cool, they tried to extract like what were the camera models and makes that we used to take these pictures. And then the vector, the embeddings themselves, the vectors are in text embedding and image embedding. And then there's some other uh, metadata here, including a similarity field, which measures how close these were. So they discarded examples where the vectors and the images weren't close together. Uh, so if we were to look at uh, an example of that data, oops, sorry, that's not the right. This is not a, the cluster's okay. Okay, it's just coming back when I think it might have gone to sleep. Um, and we have like an idling function, maybe I should turn this off. But you can see that we have uh, this, there's a lot of floating point numbers. So these vectors are pretty, pretty, pretty long, but you can see, um, this is a guy in the gray suit, for example, and this is this is all the, all the vectors for that, both the image and the text, and then we have some metadata at the end. Okay, so to create um, a a table or to insert this data into ClickHouse, if I wanted to load it, I'm just going to create a table here. So I'm just going to say create a sample, create this table, and use the same schema as this. So I've now got a table <laughs> called Sample One Million. I'm just going to set a setting to, uh, this is just going to speed up the insertion, and then I can insert this data. So to insert this data, I can read it directly from an S3 bucket. So I'm going to insert into this data set. I'm going to read these fields from these Parquet file. I'm just going to read one Parquet file. These are kind of numerically, there's nine. There's 9,000 of these Parquet files, uh, and then I'm just going to insert this data. So this, uh, this, will, this will download this single, this file, We'll insert this data. Hopefully it's not going to take that long. And that should be loaded. So we're loading about 400 mega second, and that's done. So there's a million rows loaded in about 16 seconds. And I can just show how many rows are in there. Should be just, just under a million, so 993,000 rows. No, 900,000 rows. Uh, before I just show some, can't do start doing some searches, might just be worth showing uh, the compression rates. All right, copying the grosses. So you can see that this, these are the different table sizes. So I've got one here from 1 million, one from 10 million, one from 100 million, and then one from a billion. I think I actually have one from 1 billion as well. But you can see we pretty much get the same compression rates for those tables. And nearly all of this data, all of the, the most of the data is the embeddings themselves which are quite tricky to compress because for most compression algorithms, there's not any real pattern in floating point numbers that you can use kind of standard compression algorithms on. But we get about 1.62 compression. So that's pretty good. 
one of the powers of ClickHouse is that you can actually specify the compression that you want or the codec that you wish to compress a field with. So when you create a table, you can actually override the compression. So what we're saying here is, can we compress these embeddings actually with ZST, but use level three? By default, I think it's level one. And if I was to compare that compression to of those tables, you can see, if I was to reduce the size of this, you can see that that gets me an extra sort of 10% compression. So you can tweak these things, and you can change codecs, and you can chain codecs in ClickHouse to try and improve your compression uh, on certain field types. OK, so uh, in order to search this data, I need to generate an embedding. Now, this is actually, I need to generate this vector. So you can see that this is kind of some Python code, but it's basically using this torch model. And I'm going to pass some text in. I won't go too much to the text, but it's basically tokenizing the text. And then this is the key line. It's just using the model itself to generate this embedding. And then if I run this, uh, most of the time here actually is uh, loading the model because it's just in a Python script. It has to load the model. And that's probably sort of that that there is probably that's there is the vector that I would use. I won't I won't copy that. But that's how I was, that's how typically you would generate and use the model. And that that model, that vector generation massively benefits from, from using GPUs. So this is kind of the query itself. I'm gonna run this query twice. This is this is this, this is doing a linear scan over 10 million um, vectors. So it's done that in about four seconds. And that vector there actually I generated. I should have shown the image, ap apologies, but the image I generated is actually of my dog. <laughs> so that's my dog. He's a Rhodesian Ridgeback. Uh, they're a lovely dog. I'd recommend them. They're a bit hard work, but they're nice dogs. Uh, and you can see that it's I've, when I've done that query, if I was to scroll up or scroll down originally, scroll up here, you can see that I actually matched this. A lot of floating point numbers. There's 768 <laughs> dimensions on the text embedding. So I've generated, in, I've generated on this right-hand side, I've generated the vector from an image but I'm maxing on the text itself, okay? So that's really the clip model, the power of the clip model. And if we go down, we can see that's they're pretty, pretty good results. Um, and if I actually was curious, so when I, when I on, the, on the flight over, I just did a quick script to actually generate myself. Um, I, did, I wrote another function here where I actually search and I generate a web page with the results. Again, the cost of like actually converting this image into a vector takes a while. And then I can see the similar images to my dog. So uh, we can see that's pretty pretty decent results. I'm not quite sure about some of these, what that is. It's a kind of a strange cross, but otherwise those results are pretty good on 10 million. Okay, and you can see the query time's about 3.1 seconds. Um, there is, so when, when we're actually scanning vectors, most of the time we are IO bound. So actually doing the vector computation, we can do very, very efficiently. And most of the time it's just the cost of reading these off disk. Uh, how are we doing for time, Tyler? Good? Good. Okay. So, um, and I can slowly kind of, in, and the next, if I was to increase the size of this, maybe we go to 100 million, which would be the next table size up. I'm not going to go all the way to 2 billion because I think we would be here for some time. Um, but the importance is really, so because we're IO bound, if these vectors are in the file system cache, we can actually scan them quite quickly. So there's about seven to eight million rows a second, 25 gig a second. That's really the maximum disk throughput of this box. So if I benchmark these disks, we just can't go faster than 25 gig a second off disk. So we're mostly IO bound. Um, and, and we can keep going up and up and up, but I'm not going to because the queries take longer and longer. And that's and that's the same query, okay? So uh, something thing I think is, is interesting is that uh, I decided to also see if we do some example aggregations. This is an image of a safari. I kind of envious, makes me want to go on holiday. And uh, one of the, some of the powers of kind of aggregations is that we can do a search where we search, for example, for the top, uh, I don't know, 10,000 or 1,000 documents, but we can do a standard aggregation. So in this case, I'm, I'm doing a search at the top here with that safari's vector, but I'm going to say, like, what are the top camera models? <laughs> And make some models that people use for these uh, for Safari images, and that's a, a pretty. Getting a lot of debugging here, and we can see. So it seems to be that Canons are pretty popular. If you if you ever go on Safari, then I think that's probably the model. Tyler, is that a good camera? Indeed. Okay, good to know. I know nothing about cameras, but. <laughs> um, 
Okay, so some of the interesting, one of the things that I we then moved on to was kind of the fact that vectors, I was pretty disappointed with this 1.6 compression ratio. So did a bit of searching, spoke to uh, our CEO, and his suggestion was to try Bfloat 16. So Bfloat 16 is kind of a standard that Google released, whereby by standard, by default, we store using Float 32s, which is pretty high precision. Bfloat 16 is a, a Google a standard that Google released, whereby you basically just truncate the uh, the last 16 bits of the Mantissa. So you maintain the range of the number, but you lose some precision. And this is quite popular in machine learning because Float 32s are big. They take up 32 bits. This is half the storage space. So um, I we there's actually a function that I wrote for this. I won't show it, but you can do like a SQL function to basically in ClickHouse just to say, truncate these bits and insert it into a new copy of this table. And we have bit manipulation functions that you can you can Google. And this, uh, you can see these are the bit, these are the, the, the 16 uh, bit variants, which is like two times compression versus 1.6 compression on the standard, which is a decent jump in the compression. Uh, the next question was obviously we're losing some accuracy here. So if we only use six, if we only store 16 bit accuracy or 16 bits for the Mantissa, uh, eight, sorry, 12 bits for Mantissa, then uh, do we lose any accuracy? So this is where um, I thought, well, if I use the same image and I search for my dog again, do I actually lose any kind of quality in my searches because my vectors have lost some of their precision and I've kind of taken this very high dimensional space? And yeah, I lose something, but maybe that's probably still reasonably acceptable images, I think. So it's reasonably acceptable quality. Like I'm still getting dogs back at least off dog pictures. Um, I was worried I was going to get cats, which would have been a sign that maybe uh, it would be not a good idea. So uh, next, I've got one, two final pieces I'd like to show. So um, we do support this approximate technique, which can have some pretty dramatic performance improvements. This is a table with 100 million rows. And you can see that we've configured this indexes here, which is basically saying, uh, use the annoy index on these to create an index on each of these fields using the annoy type. And these are configuration parameters for the annoy. Um, let me find that. And just scroll down, I get my results. So if I had done a linear scan on that, it takes uh, 100 million, I think it takes about 13 seconds, maybe maybe eight to 13 seconds, depending on file, I think it's seven seconds, depending on file system caching. Uh, this annoy index for the first query can be sometimes, have some, this should be hopefully quicker. Once the file system cache is warmed, and so it's about half the time, basically. So the uh, the annoy index is approximate, and you can see, yeah, I get some unusual results. Like I'm not going to uh, query this, but you can see I get some un kind of not great results, to be honest, for the dog. But that's nature of like approximate techniques is that you don't get as good quality. Okay, so finally, I'm going to just show some UDF functions that we support. So. Um, on this box here, I've actually got an instance of ClickHouse running. I'm going to just... And one of the nice things about... Vectors, once I get there... Okay, so UDF functions effectively um, scripts that the user has on disk. So uh, I've created two Python scripts here. The embed image one is basically, it takes a URL um, and it generates a vector. So pretty simple. As its input, it takes in uh, it takes in a URL from the command line and it outputs a vector to the command line. And we can expose that then as a function inside ClickHouse. The other one actually is a little bit more interesting where we've got embed concept, okay? Embed concept's quite interesting because it does, what this does is it takes, it allows us to do um, vector math. So if I was to take the vector, for example, for Berlin and minus the vector for Germany, and then add the vector for the UK and a bridge, what's one of the interesting properties of encoding things in vectors is you actually get a picture of London Bridge, which is pretty interesting that you can construct concepts by subtracting and, and, and adding them. 
And I've provided a basic script that does that as well. So as an example here, as my final example, uh, I need to log on to this instance, which is local. Two seconds, sorry. Get rid of my config file. So I have in this particular instance, which is local, two tables, 100 million and 10 million. And um, if I was to call the first one, I can do something like this. So rather than have to put the, the actual floating point numbers in here, which is pretty ugly, I've created, I've exposed and configured ClickHouse to expose that embed image function. And this is just a picture of a, of a ridge back actually on the internet and I can just pass that in, that function will get executed and then that will get used for the actual scan. So it's called that image embedding function, it's returned the floating point and it's doing the distance function for us. So these UDF functions have far more kind of value beyond the vector space, but they just allow you to extend the functionality of ClickHouse with your own scripts. And uh, as my final example, and this will, this is a, uh, that 10 million actually, and this is uh, this is hard to see, but um, yeah, that was a, a ridge back and it looks like we get dogs as well. So as the final example, as the, the, the embed concept, this is kind of the concept of taking Berlin, subtracting Germany, and then adding UK plus bridge. So I've not kind of mentioned London anywhere in that, but there is a concept of capital in Berlin somewhere. If I take Germany off it, I kind of get the loose concept of a capital then I add the UK, I should be in somewhere around London. I add a bridge, hopefully I get something like London Bridge. Uh, and I'm gonna limit that to two. Let's see what we get. Uh, I'm actually looking at, I say there's 10 million in here. I think I've accidentally put 100 million in there. So <laughs> probably unnecessary. But uh, let's take a look at what we get as our final image. Uh, I. Okay, more than that. Uh, so the URL here is this. I'm curious to see what this is. Hopefully this is something that's reasonably close to a bridge in London. So it's actually Claude Monet's work of London bridges in London. So, uh, and, and there's actually some other interesting examples. I tried surrealism plus um, cubism and then divide by two. So what is like the hybrid of surrealism? Actually, I mean, I can do it. I, I don't think I can spell surrealism or maybe I, but I, I do have an example where I tried and we do get some sort of somewhere in the intersection of that art space, but then I felt unqualified to say whether that was actually cubism and surrealism. <laughs> but uh, I can do that example if anyone's interested. But yeah, that's everything. Thank you.